Hi, my name is Elizabeth Lambert, and I'm a junior studying chemistry. I'm excited to introduce Monica Byrne, class of 03. While at Wellesley, Ms. Byrne majored in biological chemistry and went on to receive her master's in geochemistry from MIT in 2005. However, due in part to a misogynist advisor at MIT, she left science and became, as she describes herself, a, play, a writer, playwright, and futurist. In 2014, she published her first novel, The Girl in the Road, which won the James Tiptree Jr. Award for exploring gender within science fiction and was acclaimed by Neil Gaiman. Her plays have been produced across the US. She has published numerous short stories in online science fiction journals, and she gave the first science fiction TED Talk in 2016. For Ms. Byrne, her art is her activism, and her activism is her art. She advocates for fair pay for artists and is a Me Too advocate. One fun fact about her is that when she was a student, she stole an agar dish from her, a bio lab and sneezed on it and grew it in her dorm room for a year. <laughs> in this spirit of curiosity and thinking outside the box, please join me in welcoming Monica Byrne. Hello, my name is Thunby, and I'm a junior studying English and Creative Writing, and I have the honor of introducing Professor Marilyn Sides. Professor Sides is the Director of Creative, of Creative Writing in the Department of English and Creative Writing. Her PhD in Comparative Literature and Intellectual History is from the Johns Hopkins University. She's published a collection of short stories, The Island of the Map, Map Maker's Wife, and Other Tales, and a novel, The Genius of Affection. The title story of the collection was selected for the O. Henry Prize Stories 1991 and made into a feature film. Recent publications include a short essay, We Lived in the Desert Then, a short story, The Haiku Master, and a long memoir essay, The Consolations of Literature. As a member of the Advisory Committee on Sustainability since its, since its, since its inception, she has helped shape Wellesley College's future as a responsible environmental member of the local and larger world community. Her world literature course includes a large unit on global science fiction, especially that written by women. So with that being said, please, please welcome Professor Sides. Thank you so much to Elizabeth. Where is Elizabeth for introducing me? Thank you. Yes, I wrote that and I was like, am I going to regret writing that <laughs> about the, the story about the, the agar dish? Um, I couldn't open it at the end of that year. It, it was blackened and I had to throw it away. So that's the end of the, that experiment. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank Professor Larry Rosenwald, who could not be here. I think he's in India right now. But um, basically in August, I saw an uh, Albright talk from him about um, imagination and policy making. And I wrote him immediately. I was like, Larry, you don't know me. I'm class of 03, but we're thinking along exactly the same lines. And um, he read a talk that I had given at Texas A&M a year before, and then talked to Takis and Marilyn and Rebecca for me. So I am very grateful to him for advocating for me. Um, and just to the entire staff at the Albright Institute who has been so welcoming and kind this entire time. Um, and to you all, uh, on a personal note, uh, many, there are many different experiences of Wellesley. All students have very different experiences of Wellesley. They're all valid. Um, for me personally, I went to a high school that was very anti-intellectual very xenophobic, almost entirely white in rural central, central Pennsylvania. And um, coming here, I was amazed that all of the things I had been bullied for were the things I was celebrated for and the things that everybody was celebrated for and everybody was cooler than me. I mean, I'm sure that's, that's a very common experience. But um, for me personally, Wellesley is incredibly uh, important and a dear place and so I'm just very happy to be here. Um, I've, I've been telling Marilyn and others this but I dream about Wellesley at least once a week. That may sound like hell to you but it's <laughs> to me it's really wonderful because I don't get to come back so often and it's always that I uh, need to change my major, uh, change my room to Claflin. It's always Claflin. Like I need to get into Claflin somehow and can't get in. Um, and so all of which is to say it's, it's always very surreal to actually be here and always really wonderful. So, uh, and I've read each and every one of your bios and I'm super impressed with all of you. 
so much cooler than I was when I first got here. So anyway, it's lovely to meet you all. Um, this talk is about 40 minutes and then Marilyn will be uh, responding and facilitating towards Q&A. Um, but I know that you all are going to have questions likely, especially based on the reading and what <laughs> I say. Uh, there's a lot in here, so I wanted to keep a lot of time for Q&A. So, all right, let's, let's do it. So, you've read the excerpt of my novel in progress, The Actual Star. The excerpt is from the far future, a thousand years from now. But the story, the whole novel, jumps back and forth between the distant past, from the collapse of ancient Maya civilization, to the year 2012, to the present, to the year 3012, when a new global religion has brought a stable utopia to humankind. And as you saw from the excerpt, whether it can remain stable is one of the major questions of the book. I've been researching and writing the book for seven years now. The last phase has been entirely devoted to inventing the history of the next thousand years. In fact, since the last presidential election, which was the last time I was on campus, it became a kind of mental refuge. The only way I could tolerate living with this administration was to write a way out of it and write a way out of all of the systems that enabled it. I think we are living in an age of emergency. We're beginning to witness the resurgence of authoritarianism, gross imbalance of wealth, and climate change and mass extinction we remain completely unprepared for. It's as if we're living through the invention of the printing press, the fall of Rome, and the Chicxulub of meteorite all at the same time. So I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you. In 30 years, the world will be completely unrecognizable from the world we know today. But how it will be unrecognizable is not written yet. You are the ones who will get to decide. Doing so and doing so effectively won't just require intelligence or expertise or experience. Every pundit on cable news has all of those. Every consultant to Silicon Valley has all of those. Every scholar at every think tank, believe me, has all of those. Steering humankind through this age of crisis will require something policymakers never talk about, which is imagination. Even in my mind, the word immediately connotes childishness, innocence, and fantasy. But imagination is very serious work, and it will, be only, and it it will only become more important in the coming decades. We already use imagination all the time, but in a limited and reactionary way. For example, how do I design this study to get the data I want? How do we tweak our message to working, vo working mothers? How do we write a bill so that veterans receive better health care? These are necessary uses of imagination, but they only see one step ahead. The demands of quarterly reports, the daily media cycle, grant cycles, and election cycles all require fragmented, short-term thinking. We can't afford to keep seeing only one step ahead. We need to see 10 steps ahead or a thousand. So you read a little bit about my utopia and now I want to ask you very seriously, what is yours? What is your utopia? And not pragmatically, not incrementally, not realistically, not in the next 10 years, but ideally, what is your ideal world? To build it, you must first imagine it. And then you have to keep it in your mind always as a guiding star. I'm a science fiction writer. I don't know how much science fiction you've all read, but among the general population, the field still has a bad reputation from the so-called golden age in the 50s and 60s, with writers like Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, and Arthur C. Clarke. And just out of curiosity, how many, peop how many of you have read any of them, Clarke, Heinlein, or or Asimov. Okay, not many. Great. <laughs> Great. You're, you um, don't, uh, <laughs> first of all. Um, I, I may get in trouble for saying that um, with the science fiction, you know, old guard, but um, I don't care because um, I'll, I'll say more. Not only does their work not 
hold up well on a craft or a conceptual level at this point. But Heinlein was a misogynist, Asimov was a predator, and Clark was a pedophile. And so I don't, whatever one considers that era of science fiction, I would not call it the golden age, which is what it's usually called. I don't think science fiction has had a golden age yet, which is good news. So I wouldn't call that era representative or definitive in any way. I think, um, again, my worries are unfounded. Most of you have not read them, so don't. And focus on who the actual science fiction writers are writing today. So I would hope you would read Octavia Butler, Ursula K. Le Guin, and Kim Stanley Robinson, just to name a few. In the 70s and onward, writers came along who began to show us what the genre could do for all of humankind, not just white male scientists, who saw not just one dimension of the future, gadgetry, but all dimensions, how the very fabric of society can evolve. While I was doing research for the actual star, everything I read about current events, I asked myself, how did we get here? What are the root causes? How can things be different? And then I tried to answer those questions in the day's writing. The more I worked, the more I became convinced that humankind didn't start going astray because of 9-11, or because of Nixon, or because of the Industrial Revolution, or even because of the invention of race that enabled the American genocide and the transatlantic slave trade. I started to explore the possibility that humanity lost its way in the Neolithic era. We regard the Neolithic as the beginning of human history, if we mean written history, maybe. But humans walked the earth for 200,000 years before that. Before the fall of Troy, before permanent settlements, before the inventions of surplus and property and agriculture and money. All of that is only about 12,000 years old, or about 6% of our history. The fact that we don't have newspapers from the other 94% of our history doesn't mean it didn't happen. It also doesn't make it any less important when thinking about the range of possible human futures. One of the highest callings of science fiction is imagining utopia as a possible human future. And I don't mean creating a fantasy land. I mean honest, earnest engagement with the question of what a better world looks like. Here are some examples. In the Earthseed trilogy, which has, who's read the Earth, any of the Earthseed trilogy? Yes, excellent. Definitely read the Earthseed trilogy. <laughs> uh, Octavia Butler's characters endure tremendous suffering in their struggle to build a utopian community. In the Mars trilogy, Kim Stanley Robinson's characters go through several revolutions and constitutions in building a better world than the one they came from. Ursula K. Le Guin engages the idea of realistic utopia over and over again, most notably in Anares, the anarchic planet of the dispossessed. The actual star is an attempt to work in the same tradition. The distant past, the collapse of Maya civilization, takes place amid the failure of monarchy. The present, our age, takes place amid the failure of capitalism. As for 3012, you read a whole scene of it, so you have an idea. But now I will fill in some of the gaps. So the background of that scene is, in the year 3012, the world operates by the twin philosophy of accumulation and dispersion. Put as simply as possible, the law of accumulation states that accumulation of any human property ultimately leads to suffering. For example, accumulation of capital leads to inequality. Accumulation of population leads to disease. Accumulation of family ties leads to feuds. Accumulation of feuds leads to war. Accumulation of territory leads to war. Accumulation of power leads to war. Not necessarily at first or even for centuries, but eventually, always. The antidote is the law of dispersion. Put as simply as possible, it states that lasting peace can only result from the constant temporal and spatial dispersion of those same properties, power, capital, territory, and population. In other words, we've built a society that flows with and not against the entropic nature of the universe. In 3012, there are no borders. There are no nations. There are no families. Every other person you meet is your carnala, a Mexican-Spanish term for sister. There is only one pronoun, she, 
which does not mean everyone is a woman. On the contrary, it's a universal pronoun used for all genders, 1500 and counting. The average life expectancy is 130 years. The world population is steady at 200 million. Almost everyone roams the earth as permanent nomads and by common agreement only owns as much as they can carry. This is why the system is called la viaja, a feminized form of el viaje, Spanish for the journey. Those of us who cannot move or walk or carry things are accommodated so radically by mutual aid, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality that the very concept of disability no longer exists. In fact, many of us choose to have what we think of, what we think of as disabilities and call them gifts because they are ways of creating community. We eat primarily by foraging, a practice now aided by advanced artificial intelligence and augmented reality. Where there isn't good foraging, our photosynthetic skin takes over. When we want home-cooked food, we go to a wayhouse. Wayhouses are places where we can rest for a period of up to nine days in exchange for a few hours of work a day. Agrobots, farming robots, do the majority of farming and gardening strictly on a subsistence basis near wayhouses. In other words, no one goes hungry. Food security is simply not an issue. And this is because at a certain point in the 21st century, all technology began to be built to serve humankind and not profit. The name for this movement is Fujitech, or refugee technology. None of us stay in the place for more none of us stay in the same place for more than nine days. None of us even stay with the same people for more than nine days. But whomever we lose, we, we regain. If we give, give birth, we give up our baby within nine days, assured that our child will come back to us again and again in the form of other children throughout our lives. As the saying goes, the beloved always comes back to you. There is no space travel since space programs as we know them now were dependent on capitalism and statism. There are no weapons. The very idea is odd and distasteful. Crime is very rare. When it does happen, in the worst cases, the crime is made public and the perpetrator is marked for others to see and avoid if they wish, but the criminal is still allowed free movement in the world. Their exile is a social one. There's no currency or system of money. Instead, there's a worldwide perpetual gift exchange. Objects have no value beyond their practical use. A wooden bowl is as good as a porcelain bowl. There's no manufacturing because there's no need for material goods. Everything is used on a recycled basis. Anyone who wants to bear a child can do so. No pregnancy is unplanned. There's no correlation between genitalia and gender. Some of the genders are in fact the descendants of nationalist and ethnic identities, as there have long ceased to be nations or ethnic groups in any meaningful way, given the law of dispersion. Identity is completely voluntary and mutable. The system of government, to the extent that there is one, is a worldwide sortition democracy called the Kika. A legislature is randomly selected from a pool of all available citizens from the age of seven years old. This legislature is in session 24 hours a day. Its members refreshed every hour on the hour, mostly just to re-ratify a basic bill of rights for humans, animals, the earth, and artificial intelligence, but also to take up whatever special questions apply on the global scale. As a citizen, you're called to serve for about one hour every year or two. For local matters, moving clusters of people are governed by algorithms called paraguas, the modern Spanish word for umbrella that take into account each person's needs and preferences. A paragua may govern a single wayhouse or an area of several hundred qu square kilometers, depending on the num number of people present, which is always changing. A person can opt out of this system. They aren't punished. They aren't banned. They're never refused food or shelter, care or companionship wherever they go. The highest law is the rule of the road, which is radical hospitality. As the saying goes, the strangest stranger is your sister. I've described this future to a few audiences. About half think it's a utopia and half think it's a dystopia. So by show of hands, just like on the surface, how many of you feel like it's more of a utopia? And, di okay, utopia first. 
<laughs> more of a utopia, more of a dystopia. <laughs> yes, it's about right. That's, that's great. I love that. I love, it means it's fruitful for a discussion. Um, a lot of people, including me, can't imagine not having a permanent home or a set family. I love Durham, where, I'm, where I live now, where I've lived for 13 years. I love my apartment there. I love all my stuff there. Um, I, I very strongly identif identify with my family. Um, and that's okay. I'm a creature of this age where all the social norms condition me to feel that way. At the same time, I think it's important to realize that what we take for granted as the foundations of, of society are not only more natural, sorry, I'll start that again. At the same time, it's important to realize that what we take for granted as the foundations of society are not only no more natural than any other state of being, but the ultimate roots of violence in the world. I wanted to see what happened if I pulled up those roots. <coughs> And this thought experiment proceeded directly from our current moment in time. Some of you may think there is plenty to admire in this utopia, and some may think there is plenty to criticize, um, but it was my best faith attempt to imagine what it would look like. So I derived that future from our current moment in history today. And how I did that, I need to um, name a very important book. It's called Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit. And how many of you know Rebecca Solnit from other, okay, she's, hmm, she, she's pretty great. She wrote um, Hope in the Dark and Men Explain Things to Me. So she's most famous for those two. Um, but the book that felt most relevant to my research was A Paradise Built in Hell, published in 2009. The thesis of this book is that utopian communities of radical mutual aid arise spontaneously in the wake of natural disasters. Again and again, drawing from five case studies and decades of disaster research, Solnit describes spontaneous self-organization, profound euphoria among survivors, and a longing to return to that state. But often those utopian communities are criminalized and destroyed by forces of so-called civilization, especially the state and wealthy elites. This was nowhere more apparent than in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, when flood victims seeking help were penned up and gunned down because of the lies spread by media, military, and the state. Another example is the brief window of time after 9-11. I remember being here on campus, and I and all of my fellow students were stunned for about a week, for even less than that, maybe half a week, at this outpouring of radical mutual aid and love and compassion for total strangers that was ex exemplified by New Yorkers. So there were a few days when a door had swung open that showed us a world that did not depend on a constant interchange of military force and terrorism. But that door was shut by the return to business as usual, which in that case was the Iraq War. To paraphrase Solnit, we have it all backwards. The society we currently live in is the catastrophe. And going through a natural disaster gives us the opportunity to wake up from that spell. She argues that these spontaneous utopias are just as natural and native to us as any other way of living, if not more so, and in fact one we've practiced as a species before. Her challenge is how do we codify those spontaneous utopias into a daily workable system of government? And my answer is the future world I just described to you. It's a world where we are constantly wandering, practicing radical hospitality, making communities of mutual aid that form and collapse and form again. And here's why this specific version of the future matters. We are about to enter a period of unprecedented global natural disaster. We are already in it. In the next 30 years, as I mentioned before, 30 years, the world will look completely different from how we know it today. Researchers estimate that up to 300 million people worldwide will be displaced because of climate change. As a comparison, imagine the refugees of the Syrian civil war multiplied by 60. And this estimate did not include the melting of the Arctic permafrost, the release of Atlantic methane hydrates, an earthquake on the Cascadia Fault, or the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, any one of which would displace many millions more. 
This is why I predict that not only will climate refugees shape the next century, but the next millennium. Two years ago, I attended a conference organized by a think tank based in Brussels. There is a workshop on the refugee crisis in Europe. A member of parliament from a Scandinavian country confessed that she was exasperated by the dominant opinion in the room, namely that European nations should accommodate the influx of refugees. She said, how do I explain this to my constituents who are about to retire, that the money for the pensions they've been expecting their whole lives is gone because it's going towards social services for people who are just arriving? Well, the answer is very hard. I didn't say it then, but I thought in my head those pensions existed in the first place because of the ongoing exploitation of the very countries those refugees are fleeing. Their privilege depends on, is a direct result of, injustice towards others. That pattern repeats all over the world. The Center for Applied Research published a study last year that estimated the amount of wealth flowing from so-called developing countries to so-called developed countries is twice that of the flow in the opposite direction. To quote anthropologist Jason Hickel, what this means is that the usual development narrative has it backwards. Aid is effectively flowing in reverse. Rich countries aren't developing poor countries. Poor countries are developing rich ones. In other words, the standard of living in the United States depends directly on the impoverishment and terrorization of the rest of the world. Global inequality has tripled since 1960. Oxfam recently reported that eight men hold more wealth than the lowest four billion combined. The McKinsey Global Institute estimated that by 2030, only 12 years from now, 40% of all jobs will be automated. Given any one of these factors, it is pretty clear to me that the systems in place are about to fall in our lifetimes. That's a given. I believe that's a given. A year ago, I would have said that no one can get elected by saying that out loud to political office. But after last fall, I have more hope because of the fearlessness of new legislators like Ayanna Presley, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Ilhan Omar. They have this quality that I keep coming back to, which is imagination. And we need 100,000 more like them in every corner of the world. Because now is the beginning of this break, this window, this opportunity to imagine radically other forms of living. Because it won't be an abstract exercise to us. It will be very concrete and immediate because those refugees will include you and me, if it doesn't already. It's already happening in the United States. The hurricanes in the southeast, the flooding in Texas, the forest fires in California. We don't call them refugees necessarily, but that's what they are and their numbers are only going to grow. When there aren't just thousands of us on foot, but millions, how will the police keep us from seeking shelter in the empty apartments parked in our cities as investments for the wealthy? How will they prevent us from taking the food and medicine from stores that we need to keep living when no one has credit cards, because the banks have collapsed, because everyone stopped paying their balances, because the power grid has failed? The state certainly can and probably will use violent force at first. But the police and military are made up of people too. They also need food to eat. Their families will also be affected. I hope that finally we will realize as a species we'll come to a point that nation states serve their purpose once, but don't make sense anymore. That borders don't make sense anymore. That capitalism doesn't make sense anymore. To quote Le Guin again, the power of capitalism seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. And I will add the earth acts on human beings. Climate change isn't just the invisible hand driving us now, it has been throughout all of history. The agricultural revolution was probably the result of climate change. The Levant and Nile Valley were probably settled because of climate change. Ancient Maya civilization rose and fell because of climate change. And now capitalism and the nation state may well fall because of climate change. I find hope in that. I'm even thrilled by it. I believe we currently live in an age of spectacular barbarism, but circumstances are colluding to give us a way out. 
Nowhere is it written that capitalism is natural, that poverty is natural, that war is natural, that patriarchy is natural, that monogamy is natural, that individualism is natural, or that the two-parent, two-child family is natural. We made all that up. Hedge funds, corporations, institutions, oligarchies, profits, brands, nation states, borders, we made all of that up too. At the most fundamental level, they are fictions and we can imagine new fictions in their place. But we must be very, very careful which fictions to choose. So now I'm going to come back to the discipline of science fiction. In many ways, um, it's a confusing term because the field has evolved so much since the 50s and the 60s where everything was about uh, gadgets and techno-optimism. Uh, but usually I use the definition by Anne and Jeff Vandermeer that science fiction is any fiction set in the future, whether it be a day from now or a billion years from now. So that includes uh, Star Trek, The Hunger Games, The Broken Earth Trilogy, Alien, The Dispossessed, The Earth Seed Trilogy, The Handmaid's <coughs> Tale, bless you, uh, Dune, Jurassic Park, a wide range of narratives and styles. It's not a perfect definition because it leaves out, for example, Star Wars and uh, Battlestar Galactica, which most people think of as science fiction. But this debate is not our current concern at this moment. The, the point that is that fiction that I write, the science fiction that I write, and the art form I argue is most crucial to your work as future shapers of policy is science fiction. For the most part, the elite literary establishment does not take science fiction seriously as an art form at all. To this day, it prefers realism. There is a purpose to this. The writer Amitav Ghosh, in his book The Great Derangement, explains this preference as a reflection of the 20th century's ironic preoccupation with control. He writes, probability and the modern novel, meaning the literary realism novel, are in fact twins born at about the same time among the same people under a shared star that destined them to work as vessels for the containment of the same kind of experience which is to say a predictable experience of the world as regular as train schedules or at crop yields. But the conception of life being safe and stable is a very recent invention. We are entering a period of profound irregularity, of immense unpredictability, and so we need a fiction not of probability but of possibility, a fiction of imagination. The problem is the vast majority of popular science fiction today is very pessimistic, so much so <coughs> that most people conflate science fiction with dystopia. My first novel was called The Girl on the Road, and I'm always amazed when people describe the future in it as a dystopia. It's not. It just happens to be set in the future with characters who aren't white. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, I can hardly blame them. Think of our most famous science fiction narratives, Mad Max, or The Expanse, or The Road. They're fun to watch, and they'd be hell to live. Nevertheless, these narratives have an incredibly strong influence on our perceptions of the future. As Solnet writes, disaster movies and the media continue to portray ordinary people as hysterical or vicious in the face of calamity. But the prevalent human nature in disaster is resilient, resourceful, generous, empathic, and brave. As goes popular imagination, so goes belief, and so goes behavior. Which, which fictions we choose to elevate matters. I want to draw a special attention to the treatment of AI, artificial intelligence, in these narratives. Think of Ex Machina or Blade Runner 2049. I spoke at TED two years in a row, and one year there were back-to-back -back talks about whether or not AI was going to evolve out of control and kill us all. And I had to keep from laughing because that scenario is just something I have never been afraid of. And at the same time, I noticed that the people who are afraid of machine superintelligence are almost exclusively white men. <laughs> I don't think anxiety about AI is really about AI at all. I think it's some white men's displaced anxiety upon realizing that women and people of color have, and have always had, sentience and are beginning to act on it on scales they're unprepared for. There's a reason that AI is almost exclusively gendered as female. 
in fiction and in life. Think of Siri, Alexa. There's a reason they're almost exclusively in service positions in fiction and in life. I am not worried about how we're going to treat AI some distant day. I'm worried about how we treat other humans now, today, all over the world, far worse than anything that's depicted in AI movies. It matters that still the vast majority of science fiction narratives that appear in popular, popular culture are imagined by, written by, directed by, and funded by white men who interpret the crumbling of their world as the crumbling of the world. We don't need more dystopian narratives from white men because we already live in dystopia. The Handmaid's Tale is the lived reality of Saudi Arabian women. Ex Machina is the lived reality of millions of children in Southeast Asia. Children of Men is the lived reality of Syrian refugees across Europe and migrants at the U.S.-Mexican border. Orwell's 1984 is the lived reality of 25 million North Koreans. Minority Report is the lived reality of black people around the world who are criminalized for merely existing. But it's easy not to see these realities from a life of privilege. It's easy to mistake our lives for the baseline, wherever we are. Right now, we're at Wellesley, a community of extraordinary privilege, but I don't, I don't make any assumptions about where any of you came from to get here. So I'll just talk about where I came from to get here. Uh, I said a little bit about myself earlier, but my baseline is that I was born in 1981, the youngest of five, to a professor and a homemaker in rural Pennsylvania. Both my parents had advanced degrees and benefited, as I did, from generations of race and class privilege. So my understanding of baseline, of normal, is small town Pennsylvania in the 90s, during an economic boom, and before 9-11, when it was very easy to believe that there would always be such things as schools, banks, hospitals, private land, public land, armed police, publishing companies, coffee shops, and a functioning government. And now I'm, I'm not counting on any of it for me or for anyone. And I don't think you should either. I think those who reset their baselines now, who imagine and create a new baseline, will be the best position to harness this moment for the benefit of all. But I have to warn you, this work is very fraught, especially in the liberal, nonprofit, corporate, and philanthropic worlds, the very circles in which you are moving as Albright Fellows. As noted by Anand Giridharadas in his book Winners Take All, much of what appears to be reform in our time is in fact a defense of stasis. Conferences and idea festivals sponsored by plutocrats and big business host panels on injustice, and promote thought leaders who are willing to confine their thinking to improving lives within the faulty system rather than tackling the faults. So my advice to you is disrupt the unspoken agreement that there are some things you can't talk about, especially money. It's considered rude to question how money is made. We have to start questioning how money is made. I include that, I include myself in that. Question me, question everyone who speaks to you, question their motivation, their compensation, their forms of privilege, their socioeconomic background, question why they work for a corporation, question why, in Anand's words, instead of giving back, they don't take less in the first place. Remember that phrases like corporate social responsibility and philanthrocapitalism are smoke and mirrors. Philanthropy is not justice. Philanthropy is a symptom of systemic injustice. It is also because it makes the donors look good a mechanism for maintaining that injustice. The purpose of corporations, including tech corporations, is to make a profit for shareholders. That is it. So we have a suite of social media platforms and devices. All of our tech is designed to be addictive. Imagine instead technology created with the sole purpose of improving human lives. This is what every te tech corporation is trying to convince you that they do through clever marketing, but they're lying. And unless corporations are regulated to an extent where they don't have more power than the will of the people, 
and unless they are taxed at a rate commensurate with the conditions that allowed them to thrive in the first place, their existence is fundamentally incompatible with steering safely through this age of emergency. To steer safely, we need new narratives. Not like in the road or ex machina where we're terrified of each other, suspicious of each other, and enslave each other for pleasure and profit. We need narratives that reflect the lived reality of disaster research that humankind is fundamentally adaptable, kind, and above all, creative. It's been 16 years since I graduated from Wellesley, and I think then, I'm trying to put myself in the mindset I was on my graduation day. The future was very bright. <laughs> um, I was under the impression that, even given 9-11, and the Iraq War, the world I'd grown up in was going to continue more or less as normal, and maybe even improve. I would get jobs and eventually buy a house. I'd find the person I was going to marry and have children. I'd carry a healthy amount of debt. <laughs> one of those did happen. <coughs> Guess which one? <laughs> um, now I wouldn't predict any of these things for you. I can't say with any confidence that in another 30 years, banks or corporations or borders or institutions will exist as we know them. Right now, with all of the threats we face from climate change imminent, we also have a Russian asset in the Oval Office. That's not a conspiracy theory or a hyperbole. It's a fact, the evidence for which has been public domain for years. Again, I say this not to scare you, but to prepare you. Now is the moment when you must create your vision of the future. In your ideal world, how does the economy work? What is the currency? What is the form of government? How many genders are there? How is individual freedom ensured? What are the taboos? How are we educated? If you wish to become leaders on a global stage, this is not an idle exercise. It is an act of imagination central to your work. And in the meantime, instead of planning how to maintain your baseline, plan how to recalibrate it. There may soon come a time when our definitions of what we need will change radically, but if we have them, we'll have enough. For example, can you move from place to place, by foot or by car? Do you have food? Do you have shelter? Are you warm enough? Do you have company of family or friends? Do you have the medicines you need to stay alive? The less you need, the more free you will be. And the lighter you'll be on the feet when the time comes. Rebecca Solnit writes, any belief that is acted on makes the world in its image. I would extend that to, stay, to say stories are a type of belief. This is why I say we must be very careful when we choose our fictions. Because when disaster strikes, some people will bar their doors to make sure no one eats them, like in the road. But others will have read New York 2140, where communities endeavor to aid each other in the wake of catastrophic flooding. Which will you be? Which will I be? We can't know until the time comes. We can't know which stories we've really chosen to believe and act upon. Not unless we've already imagined them, already written them down, already prepared for everything you know to be no more. To quote, a, to quote activist Adrian Marie Brown, all organizing is science fiction. When we talk about a world without prisons, a world without police violence, a world where everyone has food, clothing, shelter, quality education, a world free of white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, heterosexism, we are talking about a world that doesn't currently exist, but collectively dreaming up one that does means we can begin building it into existence. In the future I wrote in the actual star, in a thousand years, Wellesley does not exist. It's a set of beautiful ruins in the forest, sloping down into a basin that used to be a lake. Maybe one of the ruins is used as a way house. I, um, I was looking around campus earlier. I was trying to find on the website which buildings are made of stone and which are made of brick because stone lasts a lot longer than brick. So uh, the best bets are the chapel and the basement of Munger. 
<laughs> so, hope you like it in there. <laughs> So when did Wellesley end and why? I will echo what Takis said in his welcoming speech to you. Don't feel bad about receiving an education at Wellesley. I don't. But I am aware now in a way I was not before that my experience here, my education here, depended on a thousand other women not having it. So I like to think, because I know the power of imagination to shape reality, that Wellesley ended because comprehensive education became so radically, globally accessible, and at the same time, because education was no longer a prerequisite for the basic human rights of food, shelter, and security, that Wellesley no longer needed to exist. This is a terrifying moment in history. None of us has the option of leaving it. But paradoxically, I find tremendous freedom in that, and even joy. It's not a matter of whether everything's about to change. It is. It's a matter of imagining our way through it more radically, more bravely, and more creatively than anything anyone's thought of yet. So I can't wait to see what you do. Thank you. <laughs> and now I'll we'll hand it over to Marilyn. First of all, thank you, Tanvi, Takis, and Rebecca for you know the great introduction, for inviting me, and you all for having me. Sorry, again, something in my eye. Um, you know, since December, I've been reading Monica's novel on a sofa in Denver. It was fantastic, <laughs> uh, and reading about Monica. Yesterday, we had a great lunch. I talked so much with my mouth full. There was kind of rice everywhere. <laughs> so, but I, I think this is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> but then I no, I was just excited, and I'm very excited to be here. So uh, again, after this really wonderful talk, um, I'm going to keep my remarks really short so we can move on to the question and answer. But I did want to give a context for uh, science fiction uh, that I have not been a science fiction person ever uh, until recently when I started teaching a world literature course and I got really interested in global science fiction and started reading science fiction from almost everywhere but the US except for Octavia Butler and I've really become sort of fascinated with it uh, because it's something happening right now is this emergence of science fiction or maybe what I'm going to call more lar uh, largely speculative fiction um, I think that what happened is, you know, particularly in the 20th century, uh, science fiction, first of all, was sort of did get pushed into a very particular publishing ghetto by literary mainstream realism, right? But also science fiction started to, and again, very much white male science fiction, started to ghettoize itself. They only published in certain magazines. They excluded anybody who just didn't do basically metal and aliens, you know. Uh, and they really started to act as if they were just something that came from nowhere. It was this you know 20th century, very Western, particularly American uh, genre, and so it kind of lost its connection to the past as well as really a kind of interest in the future and, and into a larger conversation. Uh, so, but, so again, from the past, you really want you, there's a wonderful critic who has a name that I would love to call myself in some other life. His name is Darko Suvin. And uh, he, in 1972, he wrote this fantastic article that's actually re readable by human beings. Um, on the poetics of the science fiction genre. And he, t he really tries to bring science fiction back into a longer literary tradition. And he says science fiction is, quote, a creative approach t tending towards a dynamic transformation rather than a static mirroring of the author's environment, which is literary realism. Such typical methodology of science fiction from Lucian, uh, Thomas More, Rabelais, Cyrano, Jonathan Swift, to uh, H.G. Wells, even Jack London. And in the last decades, he's writing in 1972, and he's talking about the 50s and the 70s, is a critical one. Science fiction is a critical one. This is going to really tie up with what Monica's talking about. It often can be satirical because it, it uh, has a belief, it combines a belief in the powers of reason with methodological doubt. 
in the most significant cases. And the kinship of this cognitive critique with the philosophical basis of modern science is really evident. So he's really trying to line it up with these, uh, a, a very long literary tradition. Uh, and so, but I think what's happening now that really makes teaching about it feel like it's happening right now <laughs> is that science fiction and fantasy, and in fact, what now is being called more speculative uh, fiction, even a little Venn diagram I have here, uh, but you know, it's like speculative fiction includes fantasy, science fiction, horror, historical. So you really have a lot of really interesting authors. Uh, you know, basically bringing this kind of uh, fiction out of just these kind of ghettos of bookstore categories. Uh, so you have particularly women here in the US, uh, Octavia Butler now being become more and more a mainstream author. You have Carmen Machado, uh, Kelly Link, who plays with fairy tales as well as fantasy. They are really, Karen Russell, Amy Bender, they are really kind of the top literary sellers in many ways. And they're bringing, again, what we call speculative fiction, which can include science fiction, into a literary mainstream. But I think what's even more powerful to think about and, and useful for here is that this is not just a US thing. That one of the, one reason I really got into reading uh, science fiction is because I got into reading global science fiction. And that again, when you have particularly science fiction from China, which is like uh, just exploding everywhere, uh, Lu Shen's Three Body Problem trilogy has been, you know, uh, in the newspapers is one of Barack Obama's most, you know, favorite books. Uh, you have the wonderful um, Nigerian-American author, Nidhi Okorafor, whose novel Boom, again, is totally being published by mainstream publishing, uh, is, takes place in a futuristic Nigeria, is beautifully written. Uh, so what you really have is this global science fiction, again, very much written by women, which is sort of moving into a mainstream. So we're actually getting, in a funny way, is, the way that we're getting, like you want to get us out of nation states into a more planetary world, it's interesting that science fiction has actually moved from being kind of a nation state, just like national literatures are no longer even really, people don't even think of things as natural literatures anymore. With all transnational, with migration, with people who are in one country writing in a language, that is a lot of times like in your novel, sort of half English, half Spanish, half some other language without huge glossaries at the bottom or translations, uh, that it's like national literatures are no longer certain to even think of them. It's such an outmoded way of thinking about literature. So we start to think about transnational literature. Global literature, global kind of feels bad. So I think going to planetary, you know, literature really connected to the planet. So I think that uh, we can really think about you know, Monica's genre, Monica's choices. It's part of this really exciting moment of writers who are really moving into a mainstream you know, planetary conversation. And I think what's really exciting is a huge proportion of them are women, uh, particularly in Africa. Uh, where they're talking about, the, there's a wonderful story by uh, Nidia Korofor called Spider the Artist, in which a Nigerian woman uh, kind of ends up playing music with a giant metallic spider, an AI spider who was created to patrol the Nigerian uh, oil pipelines uh, that are basically feeding Shell and Exxon. <laughs> Uh, but she and the spider kind of get together, they make music together, and they kind of survive this sort of catastrophic moment. And they don't know how, again, this sort of sense of a complex utopia, they don't know how they're going to move forward, but they are. Um, so again, I think that uh, it's a really particular moment uh, in the US, but particularly as a sort of larger world type of literature that is really much about sort of exactly what Monica's talking about and that it's, again, as written by women. So uh, that's just what I'm going to say about that. I have lots of questions. Uh, I'm, we talked a lot about the Mayas. I'm totally obsessed with Mayas. Mm -hmm. So I really want to talk about like why are Mayas out of all these things. But I'm going to just kind of let it go and let uh, 
this uh, facilitator start, you know, powering up their mics. 